Coming up on the Mindful Midlife Crisis. This is why I love mindfulness-based practice so much is because it's not just the meditation, which you can do. Um, it's not just using your five senses to ground yourself. It's the deeper stuff, the, the reflective stuff that I think once the guys are ready to do that work, that's when you see the biggest change. Some guys still like the Band-Aid fix like I did all those years, like the go in there and hope that someone just waves a magic wand and fixes me. And for some guys, it does work for a little while, but then they ended up coming back. They end up coming back. But once the, these particular guys who really dive deep, they're the ones you, you can see it in their eyes every as over the weeks. By the end of the 10th session or so, they're like, you know what, I can do this on my own for a while. I can, you know. I've got this. They're no longer in constant crisis mode. And that's where you want to go with therapy. But it takes a bit of work to do that. Welcome to the Mindful Midlife Crisis, a podcast for people navigating the complexities and possibilities of life's second half. I'm your host, Billy Lahr, an educator, personal trainer, meditation teacher, and overthinker who talks to experts who specialize in social and emotional learning, mindfulness, physical and emotional wellness, cultural awareness, finances, communication, relationships, dating, and parenting, all in an effort to help us better reflect, learn, and grow so we can live a more purpose-filled life. Take a deep breath, embrace the present, and journey with me through the Mindful Midlife Crisis. Welcome to the Mindful Midlife Crisis. I'm your host, Billy Lar. Thank you for tuning in wherever you are. The purpose of the show is to provide a platform that gives people the space and permission to share their expertise and life experiences in order to help others navigate the complexities and possibilities of life's second half. And remember, this free and useful information is helpful to people of all ages. Wisdom isn't about one's age. Wisdom comes from our ability to reflect, learn, and grow from our own life experiences while also learning from the experiences of others, regardless of what stage of life we are in, because you just never know what life is going to throw at you. So there just might be a story or two from past episodes that help you feel better prepared for the challenges you might face in life or that you're facing right now. Whether those challenges be your emotional, mental, and or physical health, your relationships with others, including your partner and your children, your career, Whatever curveballs life is throwing your way right now, just know that you are not alone in your experience, and the conversations I'm having here are with people who have been there before or have done the research to help you navigate these situations with more awareness, openness, curiosity, and compassion so you can live a more purpose-filled life. So if you're looking for some ways to help you better navigate whatever you've got going on in your life from someone who's been through it before... Check out some of our other episodes at www.mindfulmidlifecrisis.com or wherever you get your podcasts. This is part two of my conversation with Simon Rennie. So if you missed last week's episode, go back and listen to part one first so you understand why you're falling in love with Simon's accent. <laughs> Simon and I had a lot of talk about when it comes to men's mental health. And as you can imagine, if you listen to my episode 66 rant about Chelsea Fagan's comment about no more men talking mental health on podcasts, I wanted to double down on this conversation of men talking mental health on podcasts. So in today's episode, Simon shares with us how he helps men struggling with their mental health navigate fatherhood, how the strict COVID guidelines in Australia had an impact on people's mental health there, and what advice he has for those stubborn men out there who just continue to refuse to seek mental health support. So here we go with part two of my conversation with Simon Rennie. Welcome back to the Mindful Midlife Crisis. I am here with Simon Rennie. He is a licensed social worker down in Australia. He is also the host of the Mindful Men podcast. You can check out all of his information in the show notes. Simon, I really enjoy your podcast. You and I actually had Dr. Lena Haji on our podcast. Yes. She's a blast. I really enjoyed having her on the show. And I get to be a guest on your show. So I encourage everybody to check out Simon's podcast. You can get those two episodes if you're looking kind of for a feeler there. And I would also recommend this episode, too, because in one of your episodes, you talked about a spray that one of the footy coaches launched on his team. So 
Now we're dealing with you know two sports terms that I imagine you can make sense of for us Americans out there who have no idea what you mean by footy and no idea what you mean by spray, but they are crucial to understanding this dynamic within sports. So can you talk about what happened in that scenario and why you felt the need to talk about it in that episode? Yeah, absolutely. So in Australia, we've got multiple types of footy. <laughs> so so we've got football. So Australian rules football, AFL, that's what I, I grew up playing and following and stuff like that. If you ever watch that on TV, it's like American football, but without the pads, essentially. But you've got a big round oval, players can come at you from any direction and hit you and, and so forth. But we also, depending on where you live in Australia, so I live in Queensland now, so we've got rugby league and rugby union, which are also referred to as football as well. But they're like the traditional two teams going at each other face on, a bit, like, bit more like American football. We refer everything to American football because I guess that's the only type of footy you have over there. <laughs> um, but then we've got soccer as well, but some parts of Australia call that football as well. So depending on where you are, depends on what kind of football you're talking about. But I talk about Australian rules football. So growing up in Adelaide, Adelaide is a, is a AFL town. It's a, it's a Australian rules football town. And so I remember, I think it was last year when I was watching the football or footy and there was this big thing in the media about one of the teams in the national competition, the national level competition, they got absolutely smashed. Like they lost by 100 points or so, which is a belting basically. And what happened was is like the coach went into the change rooms after the game and gave his team a spray. And a spray in, in in sporting terms, and particularly in Australia, is like he yelled at them. He basically went off his head. He blew his lid off and he was just ripping into them like you wouldn't believe. That's what a lot of Australians mean by when they say, oh, the coach gave you a spray or your, your dad gave you a spray or the teacher gave you a spray. It's someone who's just lost their cool and had a go at you. And so it, it had me reflecting of my own footy days when I was a kid and, you know, if, if we were mucking around at, at training or we weren't playing the way that the coach had wanted us to play on the day, the coach would give you a spray. But also my dad would give me a spray as well. Like, and, and my brothers, if we were mucking around and he could see that we weren't paying attention to the coach or he could see that we were messing around at training, he'd give us a spray as well. And, and it reminded me of just growing up and, and what it felt like to be on the receiving end of a spray. And, you know, you feel very small in the moment. And a lot of the time you just, as kids particularly, you just, you just, you know, mucking around and playing around. But then what happened, what was interesting in this, in this AFL situation was some of the players that actually impacted their mental health and they came out and said, like, you know, it, it was, they, these are professional players. They've already lost by a hundred points. They already know that, yeah, they might not be in the team next week. And when you're not in the team, you generally don't get paid. Like you, it's a, it's a, you, you get paid to play professional sports or it might impact their sponsorships and all that type of stuff. So, you know, similar to professional sports across the world, if you're not playing up to standard, then it can impact you financially, but mentally, physically as well. And, and so I remember like it came out in the media somehow. Everything gets leaked these days in the media and it got leaked out in the media that some of the players were pretty upset by getting the spray and it just had me reflecting on this whole growing up in the 80s and 90s and getting sprayed and then you know so you know it was okay to get a spray and then you had to suck it up you couldn't retaliate to the spray and and all this type of thing and it was this whole design like designing men for the future but then what happened was interestingly like a lot of the commentators who had grown up playing footy in the 80s and 90s so very tough period of time to play football is they were coming out and saying, well, is a spray really where we should be going in 2022 or 2021? So this was last year and it wasn't so particularly relevant. And I was thinking, oh, actually I've got it down 2022. So maybe it was this year. I don't know. I've lost track of my years as I get older. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> this year or last year when it happened, I think it was this year. Um, yeah, is it relevant in today's football and in today's landscape as well? And because, you know, you think about a professional football club or a sporting club, there's all these mindset coaches and mindfulness coaches and, and all this type of stuff. So it's when you're spraying someone, whether or not they're an elite athlete or a kid, you know, 
how much more damage are you doing than benefit? Is it more of a, a matter of waiting until things have calmed down and, and reflecting on that and going, okay, how can we do better next time as opposed to just ripping ripping them a new one? And so it just had me reflecting on all this type of stuff and, and reflecting on my own footy days and then, and even, I guess, a little bit in parenting as well. So like often like when I was growing up and my, me and my brothers, if we messed around at home, dad would just automatically yell or spray in that just like you know stop doing that or, or whatever and and i found myself doing that a few times with my kids as well like the automatically you just go into this mode i think whether or not it's my dad or whether or not it was a footy coaches and all that and i'm like nah surely there's a better way of doing it so i just felt like talking about that and just adding to the discourse around whether or not just blasting people because things haven't worked out for us either personally or professionally, is that the way of the future? Should we be doing better? And I think particularly in a football football codes, it can be done better. And it, I guess it leads to this whole concept around when a football player gets injured or elite athlete gets injured, like uh, physically, and they take time out of the sport, the, you know, the media is like, oh, you know, when's they're coming back from their knee reconstruction? When are they coming back from their shoulder reconstruction or whatever? And it's very normal to talk about that thing and that stuff in the media. But when a, when an athlete says they're taking time out for mental health, it's very hush hush. And so I think that I just wanted to add to the conversation around normalising mental health discussions and going, you know what, like in in twenty twenty two or twenty twenty one, whenever that football game was, like mental health impacts about the way that we interact with our coaches or teachers or parents or whoever, like it. it it does impact us and and the more we talk about it and and vo- vocalize it the more normal we can make it and so like it's then it's less of a taboo and less of a shameful thing and less of a stigma a thing and it's just more normal uh, which i think is what i try to do a lot with mindful men is just normalizing mental health discussions well and it reminds me too of the gymnast Simone Biles when she stepped out of some events in the Olympics for her Mm. mental health. And uh, she took a lot of heat for that. And I'll be honest, like I remember thinking to myself, initially, it just kind of feels like she's given up on the team. I had that initial reaction too. And I talked about that with my best friend who has his PhD in forensic neuropsychology. And We just kind of process it together. I'm like, am I overreacting to this? Like, because selfishly, I wanted to see Simone Biles perform because she's elite. She's at the top of her skill. And it was like, I wanted to see that. And so then selfishly, I was putting my desire over her mental health and he, he, we just kind of processed through that and, and, you know, had some of the similar conversations that 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 you're mentioning too and it it leads me to yeah I, I believe you talked about that we then define people or we then label people as being snowflakes mm. right that because they are addressing their mental health that that means that they're soft and I know you talked about that in that episode too and you shared something that I thought was very interesting what was that well, you've taken me back a few episodes now. <laughs> I've had a few conversations since then. I think the snowflake stuff comes around. It was those commentators, so from memory, and and the commentators were all around. It was divided half and half. So some of these hard players from when they grew up playing, they're like, you know, it's okay in 2022, 2021 to take time out for me. That's okay. And that really encouraged me. But then there was the other side of the campus saying, no, this is this whole snowflake mentality like oh we all have to be touchy-feely around each other and we can't show emotions and just showing your emotions is a new fad and all this type of stuff and I think the whole snowflake thing comes from I think that old school mentality that again we need to suck it up and we need to carry on we can't show that and as you were just talking about it had me reflecting on when I go to the gym like I'm not an elite athlete whatsoever I'm hardly a novice athlete. <laughs> I'm hardly a beginner in <laughs> itself. Uh, I need to do more work. But if I go to the gym and my me- if I'm not mentally present in the gym workout, I don't perform. Like I don't hit that 5K on the treadmill. I don't lift the 10K weights or whatever. I might stop halfway through a set. Like my mindset is just not there. And, and mental health does that to you. When your mental health isn't, you're not 
present or or well in your mental health, you're not performing in any environment, let alone the sports field. Like so work, when I burnt out and or like when I was struggling with dark depression or like at the start of this year even, like I just wasn't there presently in in my work. And so I wasn't performing at work. And and so you know, it's the same at school. When I, in my darkest days, in my teenage years, I was going through the hugest depression ever. And so I wasn't really p- performing at school. And so the more we can normalize this discussion around mental health, it's not so much about being snowflakes. It's just about looking after yourself. So no one would bat an eyelid if you tore your hamstring off, you know, or you, you broke your leg or, or you broke your arm or whatever. No one would care. But if you say, look, I can't perform because of my mental health, like that's actually a viable thing because I've been there and I've done it. And, it's, and, you know, you talk about in our episode that we had a chat with, you know, you got to a stage where you needed some time out as well, you know, and it's because we're not robots, we're human. And so like when our mental health or our physical health is not up to standard or it's not working right, like as, it, as it's intended, the only way sometimes to, to deal with that is is time out. And so I, I, I loved when she said, I'm going to take some time out for my mental health because she was just normalizing that discussion. And so what that does is it prolongs her career because she can go away, take some time out, develop some more tools around mental you know, strength and, and all that type of stuff, and then have maybe another extra five, 10 years on her career as opposed to just burning out completely and just, you know, as a young athlete as well. So I think I commended her and I think, the snowflake stuff does come up a bit, particularly in the social media and the media around or, you know, that people are you know, using mental health as a cop out. They don't want to perform, but they actually do. It's just that they're in a space where they just can't physically and mentally to the standard that we probably expect them, whether or not it's that elite athletes in the, in the Olympics or if it's in professional sport or even if it's just in our jobs and stuff like that. So then how do you see Australia's love for sports play out in fatherhood yeah i guess we touched i touched on it a little bit there in terms of like you know getting that spray and stuff like that when you're younger and then we're like you know me spraying my kids like when they've done something wrong and i'm like kind of catching myself in the moment going no that's not the dad that i want to be you know i talk to a lot of dads you know, these days and in both my therapy but also in my social space and and a lot of them say that they, they want to be kind of like for the dad that they never had or the male role models that they never had growing up. And for me, a lot of it is I want to be for my kids the kind of guy that I never had in terms of talking about mental health because I didn't have that with my dad or my brothers or anybody, like nobody actually. And so when I spray my kids for doing something wrong, and it's not even necessarily them doing something wrong, it's a lot of the time it's me just going into automatic mode with my mental health, particularly particularly my OCD. If I see them doing things in, in patterns or orders that just trigger my OCD, like that's when I just go into automatic spray mode. And the thing is just a lot of it's just like what we've learned. So a lot of our parenting style is a lot of the stuff that we've taken on from our parents, even though we don't like it or or want to do that. Um, But I think for a lot of dads and a lot of mums as well, it's it's challenging those things that we all grew up, you know, getting the yells or the smacks or, or whatever. And so, you know, taking that sport, kind of mentality that coach mentality and, and working with my son particularly because he's just starting to experience soccer like he, he likes soccer at the moment and so if he gets things wrong like i'm like it's okay you just we'll just play around that and we'll work out a new strategy as well and 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 you know the same for my daughter when she picks up sport as well i mean a lot of our first few years have been swimming so it's, it's around not yelling at them because they're not doing the strokes that they're meant to be doing at swim classes it's actually just being happy that they're in the water and, and and doing something as opposed to nothing. And so, yeah, there's a lot of parents and myself in particular that are just keen to explore different ways of parenting based on our childhood and based on our sporting experiences and based on our schooling experiences as well. Um, and, and yeah, like it's, it's, we're in a progressive period of time, I think, particularly with parenting. Um, and I think it comes from a lot of people's own traumas growing up of what they experienced, particularly those 80s, 90s, 70s as well with some of the guys that I work with, yeah. 
Well, even that visual of the word spray, like when I think of that, I think like you're getting sprayed with spit because someone is so <laughs> yeah. furious with you that they are just letting you have it. And and part of that is is the spray of spit that comes at you. So that's such an, an interesting choice of words that you guys have in order to describe that. When you're talking to guys about you know, fatherhood and where they're struggling. You touched on it a little bit, but, you know, where are you seeing them? What are they coming to you with? And then how do you help them navigate that? What skills are you providing them in terms of, hey, here's how you can be a better father, not based on because I'm such a great father, but based on what I'm hearing from you, here are some of the things that that you're Mm. saying you're concerned with. So, you could try this skill. You could try this skill. I imagine it's carte blanche in the sense that, you know, it's, it's individualized. Yeah. A lot of it comes around in relationships, like connecting with partners. And then sometimes that, you know, comes, you know, divert to the kids as well. Like there was one dad that I worked with who really just didn't have a connection with his two daughters and he had four kids, but two were separated over 20 years. And so he had a lot of connection with the first two, but not so much the second two. And so that was just a lot of trying to connect him, find the, the joyful things that they can both share and start to build that, that loving relationship. But then that also came with a lot of historical trauma associated with that. And that was the, the driving force for the, the relationship breakdown with his child. Similar with husband-wife type stuff or partner and partner type stuff. It's how can we address the, the trauma that or, or abuse or anything like that that's come through through the years which is now impacting the relationship with that other person. So relationships are huge and, and it's often stuff that's happened in the past that they just can't let go of or that they're constantly going over in their mind or or like we have one guy who who every time something happens in his relationship he feels like he's at the start of the relationship again at that moment where he did stuff up and that's years ago he's holding on to that and he uses that as his benchmark of a relationship of where he's gone wrong and he and just can continually applies this this essentially shame on himself because of what had happened previously. And so so there's relationship stuff often, yeah, intertwined with abuse, trauma, historical stuff as well, baggage, if you like to call it like that. Um, the other one is identity as well, is is who we are as, as guys and dads and, and partners as well. Because, you know, often once, you know, my daughter's just turned three yesterday, actually. And so we're coming out of those baby years into like the end of the t- toddler years and, and into young child years now with our family. And so for the first three, four, five years, when you when you have kids, you kind of, you're, you're on autopilot, everything's Groundhog Day. You lose touch of the socialization part of you, you're like... You know, instead of going out for dinner at five o'clock, you, you're mindful of the time because you need the kids in bed by a certain time. Otherwise, if they're not in bed by a certain time, they have a rubbish night's sleep and then you're all wrecked the next day. So you, you, you're you on a very strict routine with a lot of families. And so a lot of guys, and I felt this myself, you know, going through my, my early parenting journey is you just kind of lose touch of that identity of who you are and because you feel like you're serving others constantly you're serving the kids particularly like 99 percent of the time and then even with your partner you might you know disconnect a little bit there so you've got to bring date nights back in to rekindle the the relationship stuff with your partner and so those are the the two key ones it's that identity and then yeah the the relationships with those around you as well and so Because I do a mindfulness-based practice, the strategies are all very similar, regardless of what kind of issues we're talking about. Some guys, there's a lot more talking involved and you've got to really dive deep into all the stuff, like the encyclopedia of all the history and and, and that to really understand who triggers who, what triggers what, um, how they've, you know, been resilient in the past. But other guys, they don't need to go through sessions and sessions and sessions of talking. They can get closer to those those tools and tips um, earlier so a lot of it is grounding ourselves in the moment a lot of it's being just present in the moment because we're often thinking about myself included thinking about all the other things that we've got to do in life rather than just like the kids in front of us you know particularly for dads like the kids in front of us the wife in front of us if we can be more present on that stuff 
than the stuff that happened years ago or yesterday or weeks weeks ago or the stuff that's got might happen in the future it becomes less important and so we can enjoy more of of the now here and now and so it's just helping the guys with with breathing techniques mindfulness based techniques it's around using our five senses just to ground ourselves the next part is, is getting out of the thought cycles that we, like the guys that I work with often find themselves in. They're constantly ruminating about stuff. And so it's it's simple tips and tricks like writing stuff down, journaling. A lot of guys do, you know, a, you know, they've thought of journaling, but they don't feel like it's a guy thing to do. But then when I encourage them to do it, like they find it really beneficial to get the words out of their heads. And then I can see them for what they are. They're just words. They're not, you know... Because if you try to outthink stuff, you just goes it goes faster and faster and faster. So these are some basic tips. And then with the the, the identity stuff, particularly we we do I do a lot of values based work. So reconnecting guys with their core values or helping them identify their core values and going okay, what makes you get out of bed and what makes you you and and that stuff. Once we can get through identifying the core values, we can start to reconnect them with their true sense of self or their authentic self which is really cool to see that that growth once they start to go oh yeah i value love and respect and connectedness and then that helps drive them with with values-based goals so if they're feeling lonely or isolated because they've lost a social circle because they've been a dad for the last five years in that automatic kids mode like baby mode then it's you know using those values to push themselves to go and join a sports club or, you know, an arts club or, or go and join a gym or whatever it is. That use meet up them. to meet people. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Use that type of stuff. And it, the, the values helps drive that helps encourage that helps give them the confidence to do that because when they constantly going, oh, okay, I'm living by my values now, then it helps them to push themselves out of their comfort zone. And so we're constantly looking at that type of stuff. And then when things go wrong, because you know, inevitably in therapy, like, you know, you have one good week and then you might have a bad week. And so we can use the bad week to go, okay, how were you not living? Or what was happening in that week that triggered you against your values or, or clashed against your values? But then conversely on the good week, we can go, what were you doing this week that you were living by your values and made that week really good? And so it's this constant, like, you know, reflective, you know, process which is really great in the mindfulness. This is why I love mindfulness-based practice so much is because it's not just the meditation, which you can do. Um, it's not just using your five senses to ground yourself. It's the deeper stuff, the, the reflective stuff that I think once the guys are ready to do that work, that's when you see the biggest change. Some guys still like the Band-Aid fix like I did all those years, like the go in there and hope that someone just waves a magic wand and fixes me. And for some guys, it does work for a little while but then they ended up coming back they end up coming back but once the these particular guys who really dive deep they're the ones you you can see it in their eyes every as over the weeks by the end of the 10th session or so they're like you know what i can do this on my own for a while i can you know i've got this they're no longer in constant crisis mode and that's where you want to go with therapy but it takes a bit of work to do that so yeah and it's interesting that you bring that up because i went twice a month for six months. And once I had finally developed a mindfulness practice, then I was able to stop going to therapy, but continue the mindfulness practice. And then I would use therapy as sort of a, an oil change, you know, that hmm. maybe I would go to on occasion. And, and now that I'm in this life transition, I've talked about better help on here a couple times and I'll link the referral code that I have in the show notes because it, it just with the amount of things that I'm going through and, and they're not life crises. I mean, I'm traveling the world right now, but I'm, I'm transitioning in my life right out of this career in education into the great unknown. And so there's a lot of I, stress that comes along with that. And so for the first year, I didn't do coaching. I didn't do therapy because I'm like, I just wanted to have the experience. But now I'm <laughs> recognizing I have a lot of thoughts and all this. I have a lot of feelings when it comes to this transition. So I need to talk to somebody about that. Now, 
I have the the mental awareness to do that, and you and I both know that men are a bit stubborn. So what advice do you have for family members and significant others when it comes to initiating these conversations in a way that doesn't put the other person on the defensive? Mm, that's a hard one because I was, I was there. Like when before I started my own you know, mental health therapies 10 years ago, I was that defensive one. I was the one deflecting, say, it's not me, it's you. Um, and it's different for each person as well. Like you nailed it on the head there with in saying like the mental awareness, like the, your awareness that you had something mentally. And that's where I'm at at the moment as well in my own journey. When things are wrong, are not going so good or, or they're bad or whatever, I've got that awareness now to go, yep, I need to go get help. I need to go talk to someone about this. 10 years ago, 12 years ago, 20 years ago, I didn't have that mental awareness. I didn't know what, I just tried to outthink it myself. I tried to work through it myself. And But what I keep coming back to with a lot of, this comes up a lot, this question, and I just keep coming back to just holding space. And it's the best thing, any therapist can do it, any any person can do it. It's, if you're having a mental health discussion, someone comes up to you and goes, you know, Billy, I'm really struggling, and you're not a therapist or whatever, or your, your, your brother or sister or your mum or dad's not a therapist, just hold the space. Just be quiet. Shut up. <laughs> you know, <laughs> don't talk. And because you're not there to solve anything necessarily, you might help solve something. You might give a different perspective. But a lot of it is just them wanting to talk and just offload. And we all feel like, we all feel that when, we, when we've offloaded something in therapy, or, or to a good friend or family member, we just feel so much better. And so just holding space, just being quiet, being comfortable in the uncomfortable moments, silent moments where they're awkward, pauses, and you're not sure. Like a lot of us like to fill the gaps when there's a, a, a pause in, in the conversation, but it's just about holding space. So you just picture yourself just holding space. I, I, I do it like this. I, I have my hands out in front of me and say, just hold the space. Don't fill it with anything. Just hold it. And so that's that's the best tip. And I do it all the time in my therapy. I don't, I'm a therapist and I don't have all the answers. I don't pretend to have all the answers. I don't want to know all the answers because my brain is already full. But I love holding space. I just love sitting there in that quiet and letting the guys just offload, whatever it is. And there's no bias on it. There's no, I'm not going to shame anybody for whatever. And then just let them unflow, like just let them talk. But if you're in the discussion and all of a sudden you start getting uncomfortable and that can happen because some topics do trigger us, you know, myself included, just just say, just be honest with the person. Just say, hey, I'm not sure if I'm the right person for this particular discussion, but maybe I can help you connect with someone. Maybe it's your doctor. Maybe I can take you to the doctor or help you book in a doctor's appointment. Just go and talk to them because doctors are fantastic and they're impartial to your family and friends who know often a lot about you. And they, you know, sometimes some of them gossip around your, your back as well. So you've got to feel safe with whoever you're talking to. There's mental health hotlines available, and particularly in Australia. We've got hotlines you can call like men's line, for example. There's a dedicated men's line where you can talk to people. I found out about one the other day called Friend Line, Friends Line. I didn't even know that existed, but it's if you're feeling just lonely and just want to talk and people will be on the other end of the phone holding space for you just to talk. And these are for free in Australia. You can just call them up. These are a wonderful thing. But for, for men particularly, just recognise A, in yourself, if you're about to unload or B, if you're holding space for someone who's about to unload, just recognise that it's okay to be not okay. It's not weak to speak up about mental health. We've done it now over countless hours, <laughs> you know, you and me. We barely know each other. You know, we, we, we've, we've connected over the internet and say, hey, let's have a chat about men's mental health and mindfulness. And it's easy. We've just shown how easy it is. You just talk about whatever. You know, there's no judgment. It's just just talking and, and it's fantastic. And if you want to take it further, that's when therapy is really useful. If you want to develop those mindfulness, you know, practices, therapy is, is fantastic for that. There's a wealth of podcasts around or internet, YouTube stuff. You can get a lot of stuff for free these days. You don't actually have to book in for a doctor. But also if you're you're sitting there, and guys particularly, if you're sitting there going, I'm about to go to the pub again this week and drown my sorrows or I know that it just feels good to go to the pub and just get wasted and not think about this type of stuff, 
think about the two, three, four, five hundred bucks you might spend at the pub. And instead of spending it at the pub, invest that same amount of money. You can get probably two psychology or social work counseling sessions. In Australia, we get subsidized you know, psychology and counseling and social work sessions. So that you might even get three sessions, you know, with the subsidize and just recognize how good it feels for having a long-term fix as opposed to the Band-Aid fix at the pub. The pub's fun to go to, like, don't get me wrong. <laughs> you know, we've both been there. <laughs> right. And there's a social element to the pub, yeah. but as long as you recognize it as a social element and mm. not a Band-Aid to whatever is ailing you at the time mentally, right, emotionally at the time. Because if you're going there on a regular basis, I personally have had an issue with uh, having a beer with dinner every night or the mommy wine culture. I've talked about that before. I have an issue with that because, in my opinion, it it is masking something, right? Mm. And we talked about that with, with Carrie Schwer in episode 61. If people want to go check that out. BetterHelp is $180 a month for four sessions. So I look back at how much I spent on alcohol in my 20s, and <laughs> it makes me cringe when I look back on it. It is just preposterous how much like personal and mental development I could have done had I just invested in my social-emotional learning, my social-emotional development. And Guys, if you're out there, especially you guys who are in your 20s who already know everything, right? That you you have you're 10 feet tall and bulletproof at this point in time, you'll recognize that you may look back on some of the things that you're doing now and be like, ah, oh, you know, maybe I wish I wouldn't had done that. And to me, that's kind of the power of regret. I always think regret gets a, a bad rap, but when I look back on some of the things, there are absolutely things that I regret, but then I'm able to process them. I'm able to reflect, learn, and grow and move forward in a way where I can say, all right, I don't want to do that again, or that's something I didn't do. And it's something that I'm going to take advantage of now that I have the means, that I have the resources. And if you don't have the means, and if you don't have the resources, Get in contact with one of us and we'll mm. direct you to the resources that are manageable for you. And that in turn might be an investment in itself that will pay dividends in and of itself so that you're not still wallowing in this funk that a lot of us are wallowing in following COVID. And mm. you and I are right now in the same hemisphere and we're in places where the COVID protocols were the strictest in the world, far more than they were in the United States. So I'm curious, what sort of impact has that had on men's mental health down under based on your conversations? Yeah, it's huge. Absolutely huge. And I think one of the, the good things that has come out of COVID is this mental health discussion, because before that, we weren't really openly talking about it. But all of a sudden, COVID helped. You know, we had lockdowns. I think the first lockdown that we had five, six months or so. And I was probably in a bit longer because we had two young kids. I think our daughter was like one or under one. So we had a bub in that period. And so so we were home a lot more, a lot harder than other people. And, and even in the work that I was doing at the time, because I worked in the disability sector, they considered that highly vulnerable. So... So we went into lockdown a little bit earlier and for longer in terms of our work, whereas other workplaces were opening up a little bit quicker. So just the impact of that first lockdown, and then we've had a few subsequent lockdowns. I'm thinking people in Melbourne, living in Melbourne, they had some of the, the world's longest lockdowns as well. So they came out a lot longer after we came out of ours. And so it just accelerated this mental health discussion of the isolation that came from from lockdown and not being able to go anywhere or except for to your local grocery store and it was, and only in singles and not in pairs or family units and all that type of stuff. People just found a lot more comfort in just saying, hey, I'm struggling. And even workplaces, like they were actively asking people, how are you going at home? You know, are you okay connecting in? Really? Really? Yeah. So workplaces were being intentional about asking their employees, mm. hey, how are you handling this work from home situation? 
Yeah, absolutely. Because I was in the public service, so the Australian public service, got government work for for 15 years, finishing this year. And, and when we went into COVID, before that, work from home was a taboo thing. No one was really working from home unless you're like the senior leaders for some reason they got to do it, but they would, they would then tell everyone else, like the work rants, like me, no, you can't do that. You have to go to an office and all that type of stuff, which was just BS really. Like and what we found is once lockdown happened, our productivity went through the roof. Like our agency said, wow, this is an amazing thing. Like everyone's productivity was good and it was good. Like I love working from home because I, I guess I'm a bit socially awkward and, and and I guess the social anxiety in me, in me comes out a lot and, and so I like having my own space and, and for people like me I could work better hours we could work you know I could work at 7 a.m in the morning to 3 p.m instead of doing the traditional nine to five in an office which we, we would tend to do and it was just amazing but then it you know the discourse around mental health also changed there was a lot more managers going you know, in Zoom meetings or, or whatever, or Teams meetings going, is everyone okay? What can we do? And then they you know, started having pets coming into meetings and kids coming into meetings and it became more of a family-friendly environment. And I think that contributed to the improved productivity. But what was interesting is when lockdown finished and all of a sudden people weren't going flocking to the cities, they were saying, oh, you know, we really appreciated like work from home and the government was saying, but we really want people to go back to the cities because, you know, all the businesses in the cities didn't have the clientele, like the cafes weren't getting the coffee people in the mornings and, and the lunch, you know, and so it was really impacting on the, on the, that's when we first started noticing, I guess, the economy and impacts of lockdowns. I mean, we couldn't get things like toilet paper for, for months. We, and I'm not sure if you saw the, me, the media over there, but Australians went crazy for toilet paper. So we, there was people we hoarding, did too. <laughs> hoarding toilet paper. Um, and then there's a little bit of a black market toilet paper thing going on. But um, even though we make it here in Australia, but it's, it's weird. Aside from that type of stuff and not being able to get things like new cars and technologies, like parts from Asia particularly, like the economy really started coming to the fore where, when lockdown had finished and the government wanted people to flock back back to the cities and to to create more of a, you know, to spend more and, and be more in pubs and restaurants and in the, in the supermarkets and the shops and all that type of stuff. But a lot of people weren't doing it. They wanted it. They're like, no, we've just worked from home for three years or two years or whatever it is. And you're saying productivity is through the roof. Why would we want to go back to the office? And so some workplaces kind of did it really well. And they're like, you know what? You can work from anywhere and it's cool. Others were like, no, you've got to start gradually coming back into the office, but now we're going to do a hybrid. You can work from home two days a week or three days a week. And then the others, we really want you to come back for that social connection. And and, and I think that did help in some cases. Reconnecting with colleagues in person was was certainly useful. But these are the things coming up in therapy as well for guys, like the isolation. You know, there's lots of people that lost jobs. You know, if you think about the hospitality sector, they had to go from, you know, dining in to strictly takeaway, you know, only, you know, you think about things like zoos and going to the movies and, and supermarkets, all that type of stuff. They had to really change the way that they did things. And now it's actually interesting. You see a whole lot of supermarket trucks walk driving around now and doing home delivery, whereas that wasn't really a thing before COVID. You know, you might see it once every now and then, but now you see trucks everywhere delivering people's groceries to the homes because they don't want to go to the supermarket now and get potentially exposed. I mean, we've got another peak happening at the moment, but now we just don't hear about it anymore because everyone's over it. Now everyone's really worried about the economy as that's the biggest you know, pressing point in Australia. And so these things coming up, homelessness is a huge thing. Um, we, we saw house prices went through the roof during the COVID period and, and rentals increased as well. And so you, you we were finding in the particularly the media, we're very lucky where we are, but people that have never been homeless or never been at risk of homelessness, all of a sudden landlords were, were selling the houses that they were renting out because they were cashing in or the rents were going up. So you have, you're finding people that have never been homeless, now homeless, sleeping in cars and stuff like that. And so that was happening. Burnout was huge as well, you know, trying to juggle parenting from home. For those who had to school kids, you know, schooling kids from home as well, also working from home. So, you, like, I've got this like little room here. Then I'd walk out of my door and all of a sudden go from work mode to dad mode to husband mode, and all that type of stuff. So that was uh, 
another huge one, but also inability to socialize. We talked about that a few times is going to the gym, going to the pub to see your mates, going fishing, all those types of things were, were common themes coming up for guys, particularly in the therapy, but everyone really. And if people are listening and they're like, well, we had to go through that too in the States. We had to go through that in Europe. But imagine if you had to do it for twice as long Mm. as you did. You know, I think that's kind of the important idea here is that in Australia, in Asia, it was going on for a long time. These lockdowns were going on far and the restrictions were far greater Mm than they were in the States. Like <laughs> I went back to the States after my time in Korea. I was like, what this, <laughs> this is freedom. <laughs> like, like America, <laughs> you know, it was just wild to me that just the differences in, in those areas. And I had heard about Australia really being locked down. I'm going to get you out on this, you know, coming out of COVID you have this vision for mindful men and you have been very vulnerable and you've been very clear about your experiences with mental health. What's your vision with this mindful men movement? Well, domination. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Your episode follows our conversation with Janine Faith, who talks about surviving narcissism. And it's on the heels of the self-improvement movement that (laughs) that is really isn't a sham. That's really just luring people into your cult. So, all right. All right. So what Simon is saying is, is this mindfulness movement is all a cult that is leading us towards world domination. (laughs) Something like that. Yeah. I do have this vision, like in the future, like mindful men is a lot of at its core is creating community and and community around positive mental health and 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 well being and mindfulness well being. So I actually do have a vision for community spaces for people to come and connect. And you know, I've got this this vision of I'm not sure like CrossFit. Have you ever been to a CrossFit gym? And it's like yes. this industrial style warehouse in most of them are. Just picture that in your head and it's a place where guys can come and, and girls, no, no, you know, I'm not going to exclude anybody. People can come and they can do a workout or they can shoot hoops. They can come and read and have a cup of coffee or whatever, have a barbie on the weekend, have a barbecue. Also get therapy, also do yoga, Pilates, do mindfulness-based work. And and I want these pockets of these little gyms around the world so that, you know, people can can tune into mindfulness-based practice more easily and readily, but not isolated from the rest of the world. They can do it with other people who are like-minded. And so when I say world domination, it's, it's around that. It's around these pockets of mindful men communities, you know, just down the road from your house and stuff like that. I think that would be really cool. But in the meantime, that's a long-term vision. But in the meantime, it's around just normalizing these discussions by through the podcast and and me being on other people's podcasts. You know, I've got ideas to write books and and stuff like that. But but at the core of it is also just the therapy stuff for guys. So having a space where guys can come and talk about whatever and we can do a bit of mindfulness stuff on the side, but most of it is just them talking. And, And for me, it's not enabling or not or having a space for guys where they don't have to bottle it up for 20 years like i did you know from from 8 to 28 not talking about mental health i want a guy to come in after you know one year or one week you know and you said a great point around the covid stuff is like in the us like we, we didn't have to do it for so long and i think that's a really great thing that i talk about for for mental health is that your mental health and my mental health can be completely impacted in different ways so you might have survived a, a car, horrific car accident or whatever, and I might have just lost a dog or a cat or a goldfish or something like that. For the outsider looking in at those two people, they'll go, well, this guy here who survived this horrific car accident, he's got a lot to be grateful for. He's got a lot of issues he's going to have to work through. So his, his issues are more important than the person who's lost his goldfish. That goldfish could have meant the world to this person. That could have been the world to this person. And so... That kind of stuff, it, we, we have this comparison culture in the world. And I think social media, you know, does that, you know, Instagram and all that and Facebook, TikTok. 
it does, but it doesn't mean your mental health issue is less important than the person next to you. And so, you know, the same with COVID, you know, your US COVID was very different to Australia COVID, but it doesn't mean that the people in the US weren't impacted as profoundly by whatever happened in their situation and, and across the world. And so I think that's really important for people to recognise is that, particularly in the mental health space, I love telling you that no matter how small you think your issue is, just go and get help for it. Like you don't have to bottle it up. You don't have to compare yourself to somebody else who has it worse off than you because, you know, yeah, they're going to have it differently to you, but your story is worth telling to somebody. So... You know, I love that vision of a community center because kids have community centers. We have YMCAs all around. Mm. So you have impassioned me now in helping you make this community center of mindful men a reality for you. So, Simon, thank you so much for sharing. This was a really long and much needed conversation. And I just really, really appreciate the time that you took to have this conversation and and share your experiences, share your expertise with our listeners. And thank you for sharing your Mindful Men vision with us. We greatly appreciate it. Billy, thanks so much for having me on, mate. I've really enjoyed our chats. We've had a few now. Um, And looking forward to touching base in the future and seeing how, how you're going, but also sharing more about Mindful Men. Thank you for listening to the Mindful Midlife Crisis. If you're enjoying what you've heard so far, please do me a favor and hit the subscribe button. Also, giving the show a quick five-star review with a few kind words helps others find and benefit from this podcast just like you are. Finally, please spread the wealth of free knowledge and advice in this episode by sharing it with the people in your life who may find this information and my mission to help others live a more purpose-filled life valuable. My hope is that these conversations resonate with others and inspire people to live their best lives. Thanks again. And now, back to the show. Hey, if you enjoyed this week's episode, you might want to check out these episodes as well. I've got a lot of them here for you. I'll link them all in the show notes. So buckle up, get ready. We've got episode two where my good friend and old co-host Brian on the base and I discuss research from the Samaritans Project about what factors may be driving middle-aged men to suicide, which is an important topic to discuss because middle-aged men have the highest rates of suicide in any demographic. And quite frankly, I don't think people are talking enough about this mental health crisis for middle-aged men, so we want to bring this conversation to the forefront. Episode 3, where I share my story of navigating my own mental health crisis using mindfulness as my guide out of a life of misery. Episode 11, where we talk to brothers Scott and Lee Marotes about how this podcast helped the two of them open up to each other about their own mental health journeys. You can check out episodes seven and nine, where Brian and I discuss research from Dr. Luann Brizendine's book, The Male Brain, and what that research says about the way men parent and why men in particular need to do a better job of socializing as we age. You can check out fan favorite Tom Cody in episodes 10 and 35. He shares all sorts of wisecracks and truth bombs about how he's avoided becoming a crotchety old man despite being a crotchety middle-aged man. (laughs) We love Tom Cody around here. We also love the boss bay at Tandra Rutledge. She's in episode 22. She discusses with us how to prioritize and normalize mental health conversations with our children. And then finally, you can check out episode 62 with Brian Pyatt, who talks to us about how OCD has impacted his life and how he uses both meditation and medication to balance out his mental health. As I said, you can find links to each of these episodes in the show notes or wherever you get your podcasts. Also, all of Simon's information, including links to his mental health services, will be available in the show notes. Don't forget to subscribe to this show wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple listener, leave a five-star review with a few kind words. And if you're a Spotify listener, click those five stars under the show art. If you'd like to share your thoughts on this week's episode, you can find all of my contact information in the show notes as well. Feel free to email me your takeaways from this conversation at mindfulmidlifecrisis at gmail.com. You can also follow me and DM me on Instagram at mindful underscore midlife underscore crisis. You can send me a message on LinkedIn at Billy Lahr, L-A-H-R, or 
go through the contact page at www.mindfulmidlifecrisis.com. While you're there, feel free to sign up for the newsletter so you can get access to the free meditations I send out every Sunday. Finally, I know Simon and I would greatly appreciate it if you would share this episode with the people in your life who may benefit from Simon's expertise and life experiences. The purpose of this show is to help you navigate the complexities and possibilities of life's second half, and we hope this conversation provides you with some insight to help you reflect, learn, and grow. So for Simon, this is Billy. Thank you for listening to the Mindful Midlife Crisis. May you feel happy, healthy, and loved. Take care, friends. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the Mindful Midlife Crisis podcast. We hope you enjoyed this week's episode. If this episode resonates with you, please share it with your family and friends. We will do our best to put out new content every Wednesday to get you over the midweek hump. If you want episodes to be downloaded automatically to your phone each week, all you need to do is hit the check mark, subscribe, like, or follow button, depending on what podcast format you're using. While you're at it, feel free to leave our show a quick five-star review with a few kind words so more people like you can easily find our show. If you're really enjoying the show and you want to help us out, feel free to make a donation to www.buymeacoffee.com backslash MMC podcast. That's www.buymeacoffee.com backslash MMC podcast. You can also access the link in our show notes. We use the money from these donations to pay whatever expenses we incur from producing the show. But ultimately, we record this show for you. So if you keep listening, we'll keep recording and releasing new episodes each week regardless. If you'd like to contact us or if you have suggestions about what you'd like us to discuss on future episodes, feel free to email us at mindfulmidlifecrisis at gmail.com or follow us on Instagram at mindful underscore midlife underscore crisis. Be sure to check out the show notes for links to the articles and resources we reference throughout the show. Thanks again for listening. May you feel happy, healthy, and loved.